Hey everyone, and welcome to What Did I Miss? Where today I'll be breaking down the first episode of the second season of Star Trek Picard, titled The Stargazer, and looking at what the references to past Trek mean for the season's storyline. I thought this was a fantastic episode that set up the season well with an interesting and compelling plot that felt familiar but also very unique. Even though there were a few trailers and many stories released about what the season of Picard would be about, I think the team behind the scenes still managed to surprise the audience and get us excited for what is to come. But before I get into the episode, I want to thank you for clicking on this video and ask that if you do enjoy it, to hit that like button and subscribe for videos every week on Picard and other sci-fi properties. The title of the episode is a reference to the first ship that Picard commanded, which he himself talks about in the episode. But it is also a reference to the character always looking to the stars from a young age, which we learn comes from a special relationship that he had with his mother, Yvette. His mother had appeared once before on The Next Generation in a vision that Picard had in the first season episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before. But this episode cements her as the guiding light that propelled the eventual career of Jean-Luc Picard. I think that this episode also alludes to the fact that Picard's mother may not be entirely human, and this would not be the first major Star Trek captain that had their lives shaped by a being from another world. Benjamin Sisko, the commander, then emissary, then captain on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, discovered that his mother was essentially body snatched by the Prophets, a race of non-corporeal beings that lived in the wormhole outside the station. One of the trailers for this season of Picard did include an artifact that Benjamin Sisko also discovered that was tied to his relationship with the Prophets. So it will be interesting to see as we learn more about Picard's mother if she was also put in his life so that he would become the man the universe needed him to be. The episode begins with a ship at red alert as a group of cadets is trying to make their way to the bridge. The red alert graphic is almost exactly the same as was seen in the movie The Wrath of Khan, and Picard series producer Terry Metalis has stated that references like this are done on purpose as this is his favorite time period of the franchise. The flash forward nature of the beginning of the episode, showing the ship seconds before its destruction, reminded me of another Next Generation episode that dealt with temporal anomalies, the episode Cause and Effect. In that episode, the crew were forced to relive their own destruction over and over again until they were able to deduce their own predicament and Data was able to develop a solution. The Next Generation had a lot of episodes and even a couple movies that dealt with time travel and characters existing out of time, and I feel like this episode of Picard references just about all of them at some point. The song that is playing as we visit Chateau Picard is Time Is On My Side, as sung by Irma Thomas. The song is about a woman who is telling her wayward lover that she knows that he'll be back eventually and that she needs just to wait for him to return. I think that the point of using this song is to say that no matter what type of life Picard tries to build for himself, that he is always and eventually called back to the stars, much as he was in the first season and now again in the events of this episode. You may have missed that when the wine is being bottled, you can see that the year on the label is 2401, making Picard the first Star Trek series to venture into the 25th century. While Laris and Picard are discussing her husband Zaban, she states that she was betrothed to him. This is one of the many similarities that Romulan and Vulcan culture have, as we saw in the original series of Muck Time that Vulcans also follow this practice. We know from Star Trek Discovery that eventually these two cultures will merge into one and live on the Vulcan planet, which will be renamed Navarre. Having similar marriage practices is something that probably made this assimilation of the cultures easier. Lara states that her husband Zaban passed away a year and a half ago, which is about as much time that has passed in the show since season one. This would mean that he died either during the events of the first season or shortly after, but I do not believe that we saw him injured during the attack on Picard Chateau. Picard then has a dream that includes a memory of him with his mother when they first arrive at the Chateau. During the flashes, it looks like his mother was carried away off by someone, possibly Picard's father, who has been described as an old-fashioned, hard-nosed man that Picard was not too fond of. The flashback also alludes to something else going on, possibly more spiritual, and as I mentioned, I would not be surprised if we learn that Picard's mother turns out to be a prophet or even a member of the Q. The nickname that Picard's mother uses for him is Magellan, which of course is a reference to Ferdinand Magellan, a navigator and sailor so famous that he actually named the Pacific Ocean. Besides the nickname being prophetic itself, it might also be a clever nod to Picard's ancestry and accent. Patrick Stewart has always played Picard with a British accent, and we learn here that his mother also had a British accent, but he is very famously from France. Magellan is one of the most famous Spanish naval figures in history, but he was actually born in Portugal and only went to Spain after a mission he wanted to take was refused by the Portuguese crown. So both men lived in a country in which they didn't sound like they should have been from there. I also want to point out that Magellan sounds a lot like Mon Capitan, which could be another hint of Picard's mother being associated with the Q. In the present time, Picard speaks at Starfleet Academy and introduces Elnor as the first fully Romulan cadet. 
We have seen at least two officers before on screen that were part Romulan. Lieutenant Savick from the movie The Wrath of Khan and crewman Tarsus from the Next Generation episode The Drumhead. Card ends his speech with the phrase, let's see what's out there. These are the same words that he said when the Enterprise-D left Farpoint Station at the conclusion of the pilot episode of the Next Generation encounter at Farpoint. Upon catching up with Seven, we see that she is now the captain of the La Serena and has merged all the holograms that were on the ship into one, that being the Emmett Hollow. Coincidentally, Santiago Cabrera, who plays Cristobal Rios as well as all the other holograms on the ship, has stated that Emmett was his favorite one to play. Soji is shown to be traveling as a representative of the Synthetics, the commune of android lifeforms that were introduced last season on Picard and is meeting with a delegation from a race known as the Deltans. This race was first introduced in the first Star Trek motion picture and the Deltan character Ilya was eventually replaced by a probe created by the lifeform known as V'ger. There are obvious connections between this incident and to the Borg and how they assimilate other cultures, with many believing that V'ger may be an early version of the Borg. Given the history of a Deltan being assimilated by being created by technology, it is interesting that they would be so welcoming of a synthetic race. Soji is also wearing the same pendant that was a major plot point of the first season of Picard, although now instead of wearing it around her neck, she's wearing it as a pin. Then we get a big reveal and see that not only is Rios returned to Starfleet, but that he is the captain of the new version of the Stargazer. The ship's registry is shown to be NCC828893, which is very similar to the version that Picard was the captain of, which was the NCC28893. This may be a hint that this is the eighth version of the vessel, or it could be a nod to the fact that Star Trek Picard is the eighth series that has been produced in the Star Trek franchise. Rios even uses Picard's catchphrase of make it so, but utters it in Spanish instead. Rios was shown to have been a first officer before he left Starfleet, so I'm sure with a recommendation from Picard, it wasn't hard for him to get his own ship. At Starfleet Academy, there are many ships that are mentioned that have ties to Trek lore, with some being more obvious than others. Hikaru Sulu gets a couple of shout outs, as not only does he have a ship named after him, but a ship named the Excelsior is also mentioned, and this was also the name of the ship he commanded after leaving the Enterprise. But one of the deeper cuts is the USS Grissom, and another ship with that name was featured briefly in the movie The Search for Spock before it was destroyed by Klingon Warbird. Picard and Rafi meet after his speech, and Picard mentions wanting to update the Kobayashi Maru test, a test given to all Starfleet Command cadets, and one that James Kirk is the only one to have passed. Picard did share a Vulcan mind meld with Spock, who is also the one who created the test, so the fact that Picard is now interested in this test may be a hint that some of Spock is still living on in Picard as well. The book that Picard hands Elnor is a memoir written by Spock titled The Many and the One, which is a reference to the infamous phrase the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one, which was first said by Spock in the film The Wrath of Khan. Picard then goes to visit Guinan, who is tending bar at a new establishment. It happens to be at 10 Forward Avenue, a reference to 10 Forward, a bar on the 10th deck of the forward section of the Enterprise-D. Guinan is an El Alurian, a species of listeners that was almost destroyed by the Borg, and she has lived at least 500 years. When Picard starts listing off why he chose to live a life in the stars, he starts to say that it was to explore life and seek out new civilizations, which is also part of what he and Captain Kirk would say during the intros to their respective shows. Back at Chateau Picard, there are various things from Picard's life on the Enterprise, but there are at least two things there that should have been destroyed. One is the portrait of the ship that was in the ready room of the Enterprise D that was destroyed in the film Generations, as well as a gold model of the ship that was destroyed in the film First Contact when Picard attacked a display case. When Picard arrives on the new Stargazer, he is greeted by Seven, who is not too happy that the ship is using technology derived from the Borg artifact. This is not the first time that Seven has been on a Federation ship that has used Borg technology, as the USS Voyager did this as well in order to bolster their defenses and travel faster during the latter part of that series. In one of my favorite callbacks in the episode, when Picard arrives on the bridge of the Stargazer, you can hear a version of the original theme song from The Next Generation. After the Borg vessel emerges from the distortion, in another callback to Captain Sulu, Rafi responds to the Stargazer and states that her ship, the Excelsior, stands ready to assist them, which is the same thing that Captain Sulu said to Captain Kirk in the movie The Undiscovered Country, when his version of the Excelsior arrives to help the Enterprise defeat a cloaked Klingon ship. The signal the Borg sent over to transport the Queen looks very similar to the green cutting beam the Borg vessel used during their first encounter with Picard in the Next Generation episode Q-Who. When the Queen is finally revealed, her design is much different than and almost an inverse of the Borg Queens that we have seen before, played by Alice Krieg and Susanna Thompson. The original design of the Queen, like all other Borg, was an almost emancipated bodice 
with exposed musculature and cybernetic augmentation, almost like being able to see under someone's skin. But this new queen is completely encased and shows no distinguishable features at all. Also, the fact that she states that she wants peace, not confrontation, stuns targets instead of kills them, and uses Picard's name instead of referring to him by his Borg designation, Locutus, may be signs that she is from a mirror-type universe in which the Borg are saviors instead of conquerors. Picard uses the command code 000-destruct0 to verify the auto-destruct sequence, and this was the same sequence used to destroy the Enterprise in the movie The Search for Spock. When Picard arrives in a seemingly new timeline, he is greeted by an android named Harvey. This is the same model android we saw in the first season of Picard that was involved in the Mars Uprising that caused the ban on synthetics. His name, Harvey, may be a reference to the film Harvey that starred James Stewart as a man who spoke to an imaginary rabbit. Q then makes himself known and reminds Picard that he told him that the trial never ends. This is a reference to the first time the two characters met in the Next Generation episode Encounter at Farpoint, in which Q recreated a trial from 21st century Earth and demanded Picard defend humanity. The implication is that Q has altered events to bring Picard back to his chateau in a different timeline, but this may not be entirely the case. The Next Generation episode Yesterday's Enterprise showed the audience a different reality that was altered dramatically by one event being changed in history, that being the destruction of the USS Enterprise C at the hands of the Romulans, which didn't happen after that ship was caught in a temporal anomaly that flung it into the future. The temporal anomaly seen in this episode of Picard may have a similar effect on the timeline, and their destruction now may have caused events to change in the past that would alter the course of history. Q may just be making Picard aware of these changes, and from the trailers for this season, it looks like the rest of the cast will be made aware of this as well as a different Borg Queen. After watching the trailer for next week's episode, I have a theory about why Picard and the others have to go back into the past that I'll be releasing in a few days, so be sure to check back for it. Well, that was everything I saw, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please hit that like button if you have enjoyed it, and I will see you next time on What Did I Miss?